Hi everyone, welcome back to another quick devlog update. Uh, this one's going to be fairly short, not a lot's happened of any significance. Much of my time was spent this week on one particular issue, uh, which just sucked a huge amount of time out of my schedule. Um, I'll go into a little bit of detail what that is, it's on the specy side. Um, a bit later on, after I've gone through some of the smaller changes that have happened in the editor and, and the tool itself. And I also spent some time uh, at the Zap64, or Zap Live, um, exhibition show um, up in Kenilworth on Saturday which I highly recommend uh, I think Crash is coming up soon for those with a, a more specky uh, preference rather than a or Sinclair's preference rather than a uh, Commodore preference but highly recommend both of them uh, really good shows great uh, nostalgia and great fun playing with some of those machines and seeing what people are still doing now and uh, just interacting with people best part was for me was the uh, interviews. There were a bunch of interviews with people like Steve Turner, uh, Andrew Braybrook, uh, Rob Hubbard, um, Mike Daly, various other people, luminaries from their time in the in the industry. And it was really uh, interesting to hear their stories. So quick plug there if anyone's interested um, in anything retro, highly recommend those shows um, if you can get along. So very quickly, what's what's been happening on the on the editor? Uh, a few changes, mostly um, quality of life changes. Really, tr just trying to support the the people who are uh, are testing it for me um, on the coffee page and, and in the in the Discord uh, when they hit problems. So quickly switch to the editor and uh, go over a couple of those. So s some simple things. Firstly, the sprite sheet delete is now available. Um, it wasn't before you couldn't delete a sprite sheet so if you got to a position where you had multiple sprite sheets and realized that one of them was uh, um, un unnecessary you, there was no way of, of removing it at that point so I've, I've added that the reason I delayed putting that in is it has some complications uh, when you delete a sprite sheet it has knock-on effects in various other parts of the product or the game that you're working on and I needed to make sure that I was um, clear how I was going to deal with those so what it does at the moment is it does clean up after itself. If you delete a sprite sheet, it will delete any objects that, that um, refer to it. So for the bullet example, has animations that refer to that sprite sheet, sheet one here. So if I delete that, it will clean those up. Now what, what it won't do at the moment is if you undo the deletion of the sprite sheet, it will not restore those, those references to it. It will restore the sprite sheet. So the undo redo works in that respect, but it doesn't, it doesn't um, record the undos required to restore the knock-on effects and it does warn you of that so if I, if I quickly just have a quick look so you've got this one one animation on the bullet which references the single sprite if I delete that sprite sheet it does give you a warning that you're going to lose any references in the animations are you sure and if you do it cleanly deletes the sprite sheet and removes any animations that we're using it so everything else should all be the same because the other sprite sheets haven't been affected that was the only object using that sprite sheet now if I undo it'll take me back and it cleanly returns the uh, the sprite sheet and any sprites that you had in there that's all fine but you don't get back these animations you'll have to build those by hand again um, to restore that at the moment this is something on my list of things to do is to have uh, um, atomic undo operations that have effects across multiple parts of the product but it's just not in there at the moment so that was that one another one along a similar line is object deletion so um, this button now here the delete button is also active and it has a similar consequence and, the re and, a, and a similar reason why it was um, it's taken a while for me to actually get around to adding it is it's considering carefully the knock-on effects of deleting an object. So for example, if I go to this room, which is where you typically use objects or in the map, and I drag one of the bubbles in, so that's now uh, uh, an object reference in the room referring to the object type bubble. Um, so if I delete the bubble now, you'll get the similar warning that um, if you delete it, the object, and it will actually list how many times it's referenced. So if there's zero references, you're okay to clean it, to, to clear it up and delete it and not have any consequences. It does give you a, some useful information there that if you've got it referenced in multiple places, you can go and find out where it's referenced and uh, 
either remove them or at least be aware what's going to happen. So if I delete that now, the object deletes completely. And if I go to the room, it's ref the reference is deleted. It's not updated there, but it will have been deleted. And again, if I undo, the bubble returns with all of its animation frames and any logic and everything else, but the reference doesn't return in the room. You have to manually add that back in again. So that's those two. Again, they were just um, quality of life changes that uh, the testers were needing to make sure that they could actually get on and do the things they were trying to do to build their games, which, as a side note, are looking really good. Anyone uh, interested in seeing the progress of other people using the tool apart from me should jump on the Discord and, uh, and follow on there. It's, it's really fascinating to see these, these uh, projects grow. Uh, another thing that I added again at a request of one of the testers, um, I was completely unaware at the time that uh, it, or I was aware but not conscious of the fact that um, you had there was a limitation to how far you could zoom out of the map. It was perfectly adequate for what I was doing, so this was probably about the limit that you could zoom out. But one of the testers in particular is building a much more involved um, map uh, with many more rooms and panning around all the time was getting a bit um, cumbersome uh, just to see how the, the layout of the game works. So I've, I've increased the zoom so you can zoom right out of a large map now. And I'm sure you're going to hit memory issues before you uh, um, hit the limitations of, of how many rooms you can add here, but um, it just gives you a little bit more freedom to work in the map editor. And while also in the map editor, another feature that uh, that I've added um, all of my interactions with it up until now, despite being a Mac user, have been via a mouse, uh, my preferred pointer uh, tool, uh, with a mouse wheel for zooming. But uh, one of the testers pointed out that they were using the touchpad or a, a separate touchpad, and I hadn't uh, enabled that support. So now you can't see this, obviously, but I'm, I'm switching to using my trackpad um, instead of a mouse and the pinch to zoom um, works uh, and will work on the MacBook as well and any other, presumably any other um, machine, Windows machine or Linux machine that, that reports proper gestures for pinch to zoom on their touchpad and the pan as well, so two finger pan allows you to zoom around or to, to pan around the, the map. It's only operational in the map room at the moment, map editor at the moment, but I'll, I'll add that feature to the rooms editor later. So again, another small but uh, useful quality of life addition. Okay, so the other the other thing that's uh, that I've added again, coming from a request from the uh, from the people testing, is uh, related to logic, uh, as most of the things are these days. Um, some of the some of the testers are actually building quite complex logic now, and noted. On the, on the Discord that it's a bit of a pain when you will have to reproduce or, or recreate subsections of a tree across onto a different object, um, having to manually add all of these nodes again and connect them all up. So uh, very quickly I added a uh, ability to cut and paste, or copy and paste in, in fact. So you can see all of these green nodes here that I've selected here. If I click on that, it now copies them into a buffer and if I switch to another object and hit paste, you can paste the whole subtree and it reconnects everything where possible. So you'll see if I go back to here, this one obviously was connected in and this one was connected in from objects that weren't in the um, in what I, what I um, copied. So those connections just don't get connected. But the rest of the nodes and all of the connections will and all of the properties where possible. So. Um, if there's if there's no if there's a, a set variable or something that doesn't make sense, it will um, reset it back to the zero or or empty it if there isn't one. So it should be uh, fairly safe. Just makes it a little bit easier if you're doing a similar thing across multiple objects, maybe shooting or maybe um, enemy movement, uh, some type of enemy movement, and you want to to have something similar. Um, but not quite the same. You can take what you've built on one object and just transfer it very quickly across to another. Again, as I say, not significant, but little quality of life things that make it a little bit more fun, a little bit less um, stressful when you're actually building something. 
so that's that's it for the for the changes in the in the editor itself. Uh, I mentioned at the start there was one thing that took up most of my time. Obviously, these things are fairly small and fairly isolated, apart from uh, the the copy and paste. Actually, there is one more thing I just wanted to mention before um, before I move on to the last thing, which was related to if you remember in the last video I mentioned subgraphs. So this is a subgraph node, and if you click down, you can go into it and and uh, edit the the contents of it as a, as a way to to clean up and organize more detailed logic graphs. Now you'll have noticed when I go into it now, uh, as well as the button to go back up the the tree, there's this uh, text editor, which allows me to change the name assigned to the uh, graph. So not a big thing, but it just makes it a little bit easier to identify what you're doing. So if you've got a subgraph that does something specific, you can give it a nice name now, and it just Rather than just subgraph or graph, it's got something that's meaningful. Okay, so that that's it. That really is it this time, I think, for the uh, for the small changes that I've been making in the editor. Um, so the the other thing I mentioned that uh, was taking up all the time uh, was actually tracking down a bug. So a couple of the uh, testers are building quite complex and, and uh, detailed games now and noticed that uh, when exporting to an emulator or Spectrum, they were crashing. Now this didn't come as a huge surprise to me because I knew that the um, the export was gonna be pushing memory limits. It's not optimized uh, particularly at the moment. I've got a lot of tasks listed to, to go through and optimize the export of the data and of the logic and so on, uh, and try and improve that. But I was a little bit surprised that um, that it was crashing um, at this point, even though in the back of my mind I, I attributed it to um, uh, an out of memory issue, simply because I'd, I'd, I'd run up against it before uh, when, when I was doing some tests myself. Uh, so, but I, I did get the, the tester to send me what they were working on, and I did some some digging and. The more I dug into what was happening on the emulator side, the more or the less convinced I was that it was actually a simple out of memory issue. As it turns out, that was part of the problem, but I'll explain why in a moment. But it was only part of the problem. There was something else going on that uh, that didn't make any sense to me for a while and literally took me three, four days to track down, partly because in all honesty, the um, the development tools on the Spectrum side are certainly on the Mac at least limited. The debug the, the emulators that have a debugger aren't great. Um, so there's things like Fuse, there's Zesarux, there's um, uh, there's a couple of others that I, I experimented with. I even tried a couple on the spec on the on a Windows machine to see if the Windows em only emulators were any better, and they, they typically weren't in terms of their debugging facilities. So they'll have some basic breakpoints, but they were unreliable on some, in some cases, didn't always hit the breakpoints, didn't always hit the breakpoints in the way that made any sense, didn't display de disassembly in a way that I could make sense. So for example, Fuse on the Mac in particular breaks on the instruction after a memory access, if you've got a memory access breakpoint in place. So you can't see the actual instruction that caused the memory access, which is a bit um, awkward. So anyway, um, fighting against these tools for a while, I, I, I ended up um, spending a lot of time just tweaking the code, making changes to the code, recompiling, see what happens. And this is what led me to believe it was more than just a memory issue, because I could actually comment out all but one of the rooms, most of the sprites in this particular thing. Um, get rid of most of the code and, and pare it right down to an absolute minimum size in terms of memory footprint and it still crashed in the same way and that I, I was tracing through um, in what debugging facilities I had to try and track down where some memory corruption what I believed to be memory corruption was happening um, and the reason I thought I was led towards 
uh, memory corruption as being the culprit was the window. If you remember, I introduced a feature a couple of releases ago or a couple of videos ago uh, where it's possible to set a window that's not full screen and um, to define a smaller window in which the game plays. Now this particular game used that feature, defined the window to be five blocks in from the left, right up against the top of the window of the screen and uh, 22 wide and 20 high. So basically five, five um, eight by eight cells either side of the window and four below because the spectrum screen is 32 by 24. And I've noticed that the when it did actually get it through to rendering a single frame of the of the room, the start room, it wasn't rendering it in the centre of the screen at the top, it was rendering it to the left, right up against the left side and down. Which I initially attributed to being a corruption happening somewhere prior to that first render that was was, was damaging the the window specification, so causing it to render in the wrong place. Turns out it wasn't that. And, and, and it, it was a, a lot simpler than that and also a lot more confusing. Uh, so if I show you the um, the code quickly, well this is the header file for the, the sprite library that I use, SP1. And there's this structure here, SP1 rect, which is what the window is defined as. It's defined as one of these. And in the, in the header file that I export, I export a rect an instance of this rect structure with the window in it. Now my assumption, you know, we know, we all know what uh, assuming uh, does, uh, was that the common way of defining a rect structure is a position and a size, where the position is x and y and the size is width and height. But the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that th that's not the case here. It's row col, row and column for the uh, for the position, which is effectively y x, and then width height. So it's y x, width and height, which I never imagined for a second would be the case. So I hadn't looked that closely. I just exported the structure with x and y, and uh, obviously that was a problem. And the reason it was a problem, uh, digging deeper into it, was. Uh, so if you imagine the row and the column as specified realistically in the game was row zero, column five, which pushed it, which left it up against the top of the screen and shifted in five cells from the left. But when the engine interpreted it, it was reading row five, column zero, hence why it was rendering across to the left. But more importantly, row five is the key one because it moved the window down five. The height was 20, which meant it was rendering 25 rows. Now the Spectrum only has 24. So while the SV1 library is diligent in checking that any cells being drawn are within the window constraints, it doesn't check that the window constraints are within the screen constraints. So happily went off and overwrote arbitrary memory after the um, after the uh, 24th row in its in its internal data structures and caused all sorts of problems and crashes. So simply switching out my code to, to export the, um, the rectangle structure in the correct format instead of what I assumed was the correct format more or less solved that problem. Now I say more or less because there was another issue um, and it was as I suspected related to memory use um, this particular game had 10, 11, 12, something like that, rooms, which was what I knew was going to be pushing um, the memory limitations given the current situation on the Spectrum side. So I did a little bit more uh, digging around and, and found that I could shift the start address that the Z88DK compiles to back as far as it goes, because the default is 32768 which is way beyond anything that, that the Spectrum normally has for things like um, basic um, printer drivers or printer yeah, printer drivers, that sort of thing, which we don't care about on the, on, in the game world. We don't, we don't care about this. We don't want to go back to basic at any point. So wiping out anything that the basic is storing for its, um, for its caching is okay. 
So I managed to work out with some experimentation that I could shift it back as far as I could get it and still keep a, uh, a clean build. And in doing so, saved somewhere in the region of about 8K, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in the world of the spectrum, as, as I'm sure you'll know, is. So with those two fixes, we, I got to a position where the game could actually start again. Um, Long-winded story, but uh, that's, that's, that's where we are with that. That was uh, a, an interesting one, very frustrating, took a lot of time and a lot of pulling out of hair, but uh, got there in the end. So this isn't the end of this story, I'm sure. There's still a lot of optimization I need to do. I know that. Um, I know that I need to optimize the way that the rooms are exported. I need to optimize the way that the code is exported. Um, and, and this is showing in the speed and, the, and the, the amount of memory it's using at the moment, but gets us back on track again and gets the testers able to, um, to continue building what they were building um, and get it running on an emulator or on a device. So all good in the end. So that uh, that sums up what what uh, what I've been working on the last week or so. Again, this one's a bit late this this week, I'm afraid, for the reasons I've said. Um, I lost a lot of time working on that bug, um, but um, I think that's it for this week. So thanks for watching. Um, if you're enjoying it, uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you like it, and uh, hit the bell to to be notified of when I do get round to. Provide to, to producing new new updates and I'll see you next time. Thank you.